I, the picture I have is that we've all been swimming in the deep end this morning. And uh, I'm going to call you up onto the, the pool deck. We're going to warm up in the sun for a little while and just relax. And uh, this, will, this will not be the deep end of any sort of theology. Uh, I just am not able to do that. Uh, but I do want to, you know, get you thinking. It's not completely um, out, of, out of sorts for, the, for what we're here for. Um, I'm going to read, I'm going to start with Proverbs 139. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to, be your, to, to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. This is where he falls off the rails and heads over to the other <laughs> side. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's David being real and not even recognizing it. I'm going to share something with you this morning, a journey that I've been on in my life, and feel like I have come to a place where I'm comfortable sharing what I've learned, what I've observed. It's about the tension between being good and being real. You already have heard Brad today and how he teaches, and you've heard Katie and how she teaches. And so your expectations of me might be just a little too high. I can't speak without my notes or to keep track of my thoughts without reading off of a manuscript. This is my reality. 
I also started with a scripture passage, but you can hardly call what, I'm, what I've arranged in my talk today as a sermon. At the church that I grew up in, um, on the rare occasion that a woman was actually allowed to be at the mic, it was always called a sermonette. Um, and I, I'm not even sure if I can go that far today. I hope that as I share, that you will find yourselves connecting and finding truth about who you are and how you are. I grew up in a home where I was taught about God early on. And I asked Jesus into my heart nearly every Sunday from the age of six to 12, and then only monthly until I was 16, and then sporadically after that. I knew that being good was really, really important, and likely what would tip the scales when I got to the pearly gates. I was a good girl. I listened and obeyed my parents most of the time. I was helpful, cheerful, and didn't bring any shame or disgrace to my family, though I could have. I behaved when we went out in public. I behaved at church. I memorized my Bible verses. And in school, I respected my teachers. I did my homework. I got good grades. And even got awards for my diligence as a student. I had good pretty much in the bag. I was a shoe-in to be a pastor's wife. So ready to please and play the part. And so I spent my first 40 years being good. Until one day I asked God this question. Who am I to you? In my listening time, I learned that Jesus considered me to be his friend. And it really surprised me. I asked, when did that happen? When did we become friends? And this is what he said. When you stopped trying to be good and started being real. So what do I mean by good? I don't, I don't want to make being good a bad thing because God is good so that can't be bad but it's about a cer certain kind of goodness that hinges on behavior and too often creates a, fa a facade or a mask of who we really are. Christians are really good at being good. There's the sweet smile and the kind words and the gentle touch and all kinds of sweet Christian swears. But the good facade may not be doing us any favors. The church has made being good easy because there are all kinds of measuring sticks to chart your progress to goodness. There's your Sunday morning attendance. There's your volunteer status. There's your understanding of the right theology. And so we have created this scenario where our good behavior is rewarded, commended, and honored. And it's raised as a standard that might obscure who we really are. If goodness requires conformity, it is no longer good. It's just a form of manipulation. So what do I mean by real? I don't mean that real isn't good, or that being real and good can't coexist, or that they have to be exclusive. Real is being authentic. It's taking off any sort of a facade that would cover up the truest version of yourself. Being real means I have to be vulnerable about how I might feel about something or say something that someone might not like 
or want to hear, or do or not do something that brings displeasure to someone else. Being real is not a license to be mean or nasty or to use words to hurt others. It's not about telling it like it is. Being real is not to be used as a weapon. Being real is laying yourself bare. It might mean you tell others that you're scared or strong or tired or sad. Being real requires you to be self-aware enough to know who you are and how you are. Being real might require you to shove your foot in the way of an elevator door closing in order to confront someone in authority and plead with them to do the right thing. And I know I'm getting political there, so pardon me. <laughs> the cost of being good. Being good is exhausting. You are constantly trying to figure out what's required of you. You have to figure out what the next person or committee, family member or coworker wants from you. There's no real plumb line that you can stand up to because every person and situation will require something else of you. Being good may have you twisted into a pretzel and wondering why you're all bent out of shape. <coughs> Being good probably means you are denying your own real needs at best and completely unaware of what your needs are at worst. The good facade can become such an integral part of you that it's no longer just a mask that you wear, but it's a mask that you can't take off. Being good is a version of you, but it's not the true version of you. You hand over a lot of power when you're trying to be good. Usually your goodness is measured by someone else. And whether or not you measure up has very little to do with who you are, but rather how you have performed and how you have measured um, in that person's view. Being good often requires conformity and a denying of your true self for the sake of pleasing someone else. But there's a cost to being real too. Being authentic comes at a very high cost. It, possibly, it is possible you will be misunderstood. It's probable that you will disappoint someone and highly likely that something you have shared will be used against you. The stakes are high. Being real is hard work. It means you have to look in the mirror and face yourself. It also means you need to come clean with God. Not that he's ever been fooled by your good facade. Authenticity is about taking stock of the good, the bad, and the ugly, and taking stock of it with God at your side. Do you think that he doesn't know that you've hidden yourself, the shadowy bits, out of his sight? Clearly not. Being real may be painful. That good facade won't be easy to remove. But every little bit of that that you can scrape off makes room for the more authentic version of you. Jesus was real and good. Jesus was real and Jesus was real good. Jesus was real in the desert when he didn't bow to the desires of another and when he demonstrated that he knew and understood who and what he was. Jesus was real in the temple when he moved against the establishment 
challenging the powers of the temple and embracing his own authority. Jesus was real in the garden when he wept and pleaded with his father to not have to go through the ordeal that was before him. Jesus was real on the cross when he forgave his enemies even while suffering injustice. And Jesus was real because he knew who he was and he knew what he was and what was required. There is good fruit from being real and authentic. Uh, in 2008, when Brad stepped down from pastoring our little church and the, uh, and the leadership team asked me to step up, um, I was terrified. When I said yes to becoming the lead pastor at our little church called Fresh Wind, I had a caveat for God. I said, okay, I'll do it but I don't want to be vulnerable. If I could actually see God's face in that moment, it would definitely have a smirk on it. And this is what he said to me. On the contrary, your vulnerability will be the cornerstone of your ministry. The fruit of my authentic vulnerability and my being real was that it set a precedent that everyone was allowed to be authentic and vulnerable and real. It was permission to be our best selves by being our most true selves. Being real meant that people around me knew if I wasn't doing well, or if I was struggling, or if I needed help. It also meant they came alongside and loved me in my weakness and cheered me in my strength. Being real and authentically me means that I'm fully known and fully loved. I'm not trying to be good so that I'm loved or valued or whatever sort of need I might have. Who I am and how I am on my best and on my worst, I am known and I am loved. Being real comes with a kind of freedom that breaks off the chains that I wore as a good girl for 40 years. It means that I can come to church on a Sunday morning and cry during a song that seems to express my deep needs and my sorrows. It means I can share even the most painful of things happening in my life and know that sharing that is better than carrying it home alone again for another week. It means I might get tapped on the shoulder to be asked how I'm doing or how that situation is that I shared. It means I might be accountable to share a bit further and actually make a friend. Being real will likely provide all of us with journey mates, people who are now invested in our story, in us, in how we're doing. I want to share something that uh, our son Dominic came home from school with. He's um, just finishing up a year of uh, community college and um, he while we were driving, shared this with me. And I think it really nails the difference between being good and being real. And I know Breen Brown has shared it, but I don't think it's original to her. It's this, if I have to be like you, I fit. If I get to be myself, I belong. And I want us all to belong. The questions are, where do you feel it easiest to be real? And where do you find it easiest to be good?
And is there any reason you couldn't be real good in both those places?